Hello, Chambri Basur, Luk Sre, Luk Pro, Bang Pa Owen, Tang Ah, Song Fakum. Welcome, everybody, to this special CKS event. My name is Eve Zucker, and as president of CKS, I'll be hosting this event today, which is called A Reflection on the Myanmar Military Coup, a Cambodian Perspective with Professor Kosal Pat. Uh, Kosal, okay, good, here you are. Um, so uh, before we get started, just a little bit of, of background here. Um, for those of you not familiar with CKS, we are a nonprofit dedicated to expanding knowledge about Cambodia in connection with higher education institutions, both in Cambodia and also abroad. Um, you can find more information if you're interested about CKS on our website at KhmerStudies.org, or also um, you can find us on several different uh, social media pages, including LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and Facebook. Uh, and yeah, I think I got them all there. Um, maybe we can put those addresses then in the chat for you if you don't have them already. Um, okay, so I'd like to begin by this evening by thanking everyone for joining us tonight or this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. We know it was very last minute, so I'm really pleased that you can all make it here. And I'm especially thankful to our guest, uh, Kosal Pat, for on very short notice agreeing to do this within, what, four days time or something like that. And um, also, I want to give a big thank you to uh, Sung Samadhi, our CKS Head of Programs, and Tri Sanghi, our Communications Officer, who did an incredible job of pulling all this together at warp speed. Um, so we really appreciate them doing that because they had to really adjust their schedules around to make it all happen. Um, so just a little bit about the format of today's talk. Um, this is going to be a, a slightly unusual format. It's not going to be like a typical talk. It's going to be more of a question and, and answer type of format, and it's going to run for about 20 minutes. So in the first 20 minutes, I'll be uh, give or take a little bit. Um, I'll ask uh, Kosal some questions and he'll have an opportunity to answer them and then we're going to open it up to all of you to have a chance to ask questions as well to Dr. Pat. So um, that's the basic structure. If you want to uh, ask a question and you're on the Zoom, you can put it to the question box and we'll also be uh, doing our best to field questions coming from Facebook as well. Uh, so that's the plan and so now um, I would like to introduce our guest, Kosal Pat. So Dr. Kosal Pat is an associate professor of political science and the chair of the master's program in international studies in, um, at Brooklyn College. And uh, in Brooklyn College, in case you didn't know, is also part of the, the city of New York, City University of New York um, in New York. Um, after receiving his doctoral degree in international relations from the University of Southern California, Dr. Path worked as a researcher for both the Cambodian Genocide Program at Yale and also for the uh, Documentation Center um, in Cambodia. And um, then he went back for a little while to teach international relations at USC before taking a position that he now holds at Brooklyn College as associate professor and where he teaches about international relations, genocide, and human rights. Um, he has published numerous articles and also book chapters on topics relating to the Cambodian genocide, um, also Vietnam and Vietnam's relationship with China. And he has a recent, very recent book that just came out from University of Wisconsin that's titled Vietnam Strategic Thinking During the Third Indochina War. Uh, so, Dr. Path is here, is here to, with us today to talk about the very recent situation that has um, just occurred in Myanmar over towards, well, here towards the end of last weekend and the beginning of the week on Monday. Um, and uh, as we've all been following it closely, uh, he had managed to take a trip there, uh, you know, there for, was there for a visit not too long ago, and he's been in contact with friends and colleagues there since then throughout this. So without further ado, uh, let's get started. Are you ready, Kosal? <laughs> uh, yes. So uh, one 
minor correction, actually. Uh, I worked for the Documentation Center of Cambodia and the Cambodian Genocide Program at Yale University before uh, I came to the U.S. to pursue my doctoral degree at the University of Southern California. So just a small correction. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so um, what well, this talk was pretty much a reflection of what um, I saw and what I've heard during my trip to Myanmar. So I traveled to uh, from uh, from the Mandalay to Naypyidaw, the capital city of Myanmar, and I get a, an opportunity to to interact with a lot of um, um, people, especially uh, professors, students, um, the National League for Democracy activists, and and some people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at that time. And so, uh, to be sure, I'm not an expert on Myanmar, but I I do teach um, um, do research uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. So there's a connection there. That's what I wanted to talk about. And so, but before I get to that, so uh, the regional implications uh, of what happened uh, on February 1st, uh, is I want to sort of give you what, you know, what I saw and what I heard. So I, had, I have to say that many students uh, that I, I got a chance to, uh, to talk to at the University of Mandalay were very brave and they asked me questions quite unexpectedly for someone who, uh, who know the, you know a bit about the history of uh, the military in Myanmar. So they asked me questions about, I gave a talk about, you know, the Vietnamese military, about the relationship between the military and the civilian leadership within the Communist Party of Vietnam. And so after I finished my, uh, uh, my lecture and they asked me about, you know, uh, yeah, we have a problem here too in Myanmar, the problem with the military. And they think that uh, the military have still have too, uh, too much power in, in, in the government, in national politics. So these are the kind of questions from the students, and I, I thought they were very brave. And, and so uh, what I got from there is that they're very concerned about uh, uh, the resilient power of the military at the Tamadar, the military junta, uh, who has been in power, you know, since 1962, you know, through successive uh, sort of different types of military government. But again, you know, they pretty much the, the military was in, has been in charge for, you know, since 1962. And so, um, so the question is, is this, you know, February 1st event? So in this, clearly we call it a coup d'etat, right? It's, it's a coup, an illegal coup. We want to be sure, we want to call it uh, what it is. Is it a coup? And so, uh, it, you know, to the people that I talk to, they, they, they're not expect, they're, this is not unexpectable. Uh, it's not unpredictable. Uh, and even not even a surprise to those who have closely uh, followed the military moves, uh, you know, since, 19, uh, since the, um, the 2008 uh, constitution. Right, and so, uh, so what's uh, happening right now? So there's a widespread civil disobedience. You know, I think doctors, uh, you know, students uh, and, and and activists uh, coming out and protest um, uh, this uh, this illegal coup against uh, the you know a democratically elected government. Uh, um, so. That is what was happening. And I also seen that, that again, it's kind of confirmed uh, what I saw over there is that young people in Myanmar uh, are very brave, right? They're very, very brave. And uh, so I, I'm sure you all know that the, uh, the, the talk about the military uh, leadership switch off and on, you know, uh, the internet, Facebook, um, and so forth. So Young people have been very sophisticated so uh, now. That I think very different from the 1998, 89 uh, um, uh, coded uh, uh, back back then. You know, the internet was not widely used in in Myanmar, and I saw that you know internet was widely used when I was there in 2018. And so, young people in Myanmar have been very sophisticated. Like Cambodia, like Vietnam, they they they're very sophisticated in finding ways uh, to communicate with the rest of the world and send out messages. And I just see so many messages pictures uh, from uh, from my close friends and, and, and other colleagues uh, uh, and some of them I have to say that part they are on the run right now um, you know so these activists are really have been very fearful of their family have been on the run uh, since February 1st and so and this is quite personal to me they're quite personal to me and uh, so uh, to begin so so what actually happens I want to I want to share with you what I see um, happening. 
So now the military, the Tamadar, has argued that they have the legal right to take over the government in case of national emergency. And this is a national emergency. So they claim to be acting lawfully according to the 2008 constitution, because when there's a national emergency, national sovereignty under threat, and they claim the responsibility to, as a caretaker to take over the government for some time and then promise a uh, so-called free and fair election, right? And so... So to be sure, they claim to be they the one who actually preserved the democracy, uh, the rule of law. But in reality, that's not the truth. And the truth is 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 clear that this is a landslide election, not a close election. This is an illegal coup against uh, the will of the people, right? Against the will of people, and that's what it is. We should call it uh, a coup, not some kinds of uh, you know uh, an election. Uh, um, trying to, uh, you know, make sure the election free and fair. The election on November 8th was free and fair. And the winner is clearly, resoundingly clear, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's party, the National League for Democracy. And so, so what actually happened? So beyond this whale well of defending the law, the, the, I, I think the, the Tamara has, uh, clearly has a plan, you know, I mean, they, they very, they, they're survivor of many, many sanctions by the West and they've been in power for so, so many years. I mean, it's, uh, they're well connected, very wealthy. Um, and, and so uh, this is a plan. I think this is a plan coup. It's not all of a sudden it's happened, they plan. Go back to 2008, right? So who wrote the 2008 constitution? It's a time of all. The military wrote the constitution in 2008. And what essentially the constitution basically provides um, the Tatmadaw, the veto power, right? As a supreme leader, you know, similar to in North Korea. I mean, it's, it's not the same, but it's sort of the role of a supreme leader uh, of the country as the caretaker of the country in case of national emergency or national sovereignty. And so they proclaim to be above party politics, right? And of course, they have the monopoly on coercion, the armed forces of the country, the three branches of the national security. And so, uh, so they're very powerful, right? And it's above national politics and they did not have to run for uh, election. They, according to the constitution, they have 25% of uh, the, the, the parliamentary and the parliament, the seats in the parliament. Uh, basically they have the veto power to any attempt to change the constitution or reform the constitution that would undercut uh, their power. So that is very important to know, right? So these 25% of the seat, these are unelected military representative, right? Uh, so basically they have the veto power because it requires 70%, uh, over 70, uh, uh, 5% to pass any resolute uh, amendment to the constitution or any change to the constitution. So really, this is really to ensure the permanent power Right of the military at the time of as the you know at the paramount leader of the country right as a caretaker of the country at the terms I used a while ago right that is 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 the role of the the time of and then they have this sort of a proxy political party you know the Union uh, Solidarity for uh, Development Party so the USDP uh, claim to be national true nationalist right uh, you know they you know they champion the idea of the union, right? The non-disintegration of the union. And so this sort of a proxy uh, a party of uh, the allies with the uh, the Tatmado and mostly um, ex-military officer would kind of, you know, resign, you know, retire from the military and simply move to this political party. So this is a front, a, an arm of the, a political arm of the, uh, the, the Tatmado. So, Based on this constitution, basically the, the, the most important uh, takeaway from this constitution is the three principles, the three main uh, uh, national causes. Uh, this is about national sovereignty and territorial integrity of Myanmar, right? So in terms of national securities and sovereignty, they proclaim, the Tatmara proclaim to be the vanguard of national security and national sovereignty. So basically, it, they the father of the country, right? So they assume this sort of fatherly role uh, to protect, to defend um, the country from 
ex- internal and external interference. Uh, and so, uh, and, and this constitution essentially guarantee their permanent power, that no matter what happened, no matter when, who win the election, that the military will have the right to shape national politics, right? So what's happening on uh, February 1st is basically uh, the proxy party of the Taliban lost, lost badly in the November 8th election, but they're not powerless. And so this has been planned all along. So when they lose it, like they don't like the, re- the, the result of the election, they would say, well, it's a fraudulent election, right? And it has those 10, over 10 million ballots uh, has to have to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, have to be delitigated by the, 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 by the court. But the problem with this is that the uh, judicial branch of the government is subordinate, uh, sub- subordinated to the, the Taliban or to the military. It's not an independent court. And so basically they create the crisis and then ask a demand that the, the winner, the National League for Democracy, uh, to uh, accept their accusations of a, you know, over 10 million fraud against this sort of a tactic uh, to basically, because they, they, they know that the, the, the National League for Democracy's leader would not accept that because when, you know, they don't trust the court, but the court is not independent and subordinate to the the military. And so they create a crisis and then say, well, this is a national crisis, a political crisis. And now um, if there is an emergency, national emergency, and the military will have to take to resume full power of the government and stay in power for one more year. And then we'll uh, reconsider, uh, you know, calling for another election. With, so they basically simply say, we're going to have another election a year from now. And they're going to, if they don't like the result, they will say, well, you know, as fraudulent again, they're going to run, rerun the election until the re- they like the result. So this is not democracy. This is purely a hostile power grab, a hostile takeover of power from a democratically elected uh, uh, government. So that's what I think what it is. I, I think that the, 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 the bigger point is that the military has planned, has a good plan, has, has I mean, they, they planned this from, you know, a decade ago. The 2008 constitution was crafted with this in mind, with this situation, this crisis in mind, right? And so when there's a crisis like this, they will take over uh, power from the governments and then um, say, well, this is a national crisis. This is an, uh, a problem of uh, national sovereignty. So uh, again, the three cardinal principles are under threat. And so they resume the, the role of the vanguard of the nation. Um, Thank you for giving such a, a clear and concise explanation of, of what happened and description also and including, you know, your own connection with that. So I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, right now, you know, Southeast Asia, there's a number of countries at the moment that are having struggles between democracy and authoritarian leanings, shall we say. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the significance, really, of this coup and of this and things that have transpired since, uh, both for the region and also for Cambodia in particular? For in particular. Uh, well, for, for 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 the region, I, I think this uh, this coup uh, has regional has major you know implication on the region, ASEAN in particular, and, and, and the West um, as well uh, at the international level. But, but let's talk about what, what happening in ASEAN. You know, this coup has, is, is, this coup is, is, is a reckoning for ASEAN, right? It's a violation of the ASEAN Charter, um, because in the ASEAN Charter, if you look at it clearly, it's, it's the, that's the motto of the, you know, one vision, one identity, one community. And not actually the model of the ASEAN Charter. And so the ASEAN aspiration for a collective identity with a strong sense of V-feeling, I think is really shattered by this coup because really this is a front and center problem for ASEAN going forward because they have to, to deal with this issue of the question of um, uh, value. What is the, what's the set of ASEAN value? What are the common values and identity of ASEAN, right? Uh, if you look across, you have to be honest, you know, Except Indonesia, uh, we have um, uh, authoritarian regimes of different types. You know, uh, you know, from 
communist Vietnam to a one party dominant Cambodia and to a military junta in Thailand. Thailand situation is sort of a softer version of the sort of the military uh, junta in, in Myanmar. So, and then you have Brunei is sort of auto, auto, autocratic regimes, uh, uh, Singapore soft authoritarian. So whatever you, you say that this re region is not well known for strong democratic principle. Uh, so uh, we, we, all we need to do is to look at the, the response, right? The response, the ASEAN leaders' response, immediate responses to this coup. Uh, so you have a division, right? So you have Malaysia, uh, Singapore, and Indonesia expressing some concern, right? The term concern about the political crisis in Myanmar. And the rest are simply either silent or just simply um, say, well, this is strictly an internal affairs of Myanmar. For example, Cambodia, you know, doesn't want to have any business interfering in domestic affair of its fellow ASEAN, uh, ASEAN member. And, and because you know, we all know uh, that the Cambodian government demand that uh, uh, its neighbors and other great power respect Cambodia's sovereignty, national sovereignty, right? And, and, and this has, Cambodia has been very consistent on the principle of national sovereignty and express a, take a neutral position on Myanmar. And that is hardly surprising. Uh, it's also very cons consistent with the one out uh, uh, important principle of ASEAN, and that is the non-intervention principle enshrined in the ASEAN Charter. And so I'm not very uh, surprised by the response, but what I'm, I'm surprised by the division in ASEAN, right? because if ASEAN want to be more relevant, right, in the international community, want to be a central player, this cannot go on. I mean, at least, at the say the least, they should say or call what happened on February 1st, what it is, and that is a coup, an illegal coup against uh, the will of the people of Myanmar. And that, I think, the least they could, they could do. And what I would personally want to see is that they take a much more a much more forceful step, but not just a concern, but this is really, because it really undermined the core principle and values of ASEAN's community. If that is their aspiration to be a democrat, you know, because democracy and rule of law is enshrined in the ASEAN Charter. If that, they're serious about that, then you gotta take a more forceful action. For example, they might want to consider, you know, threatening the Miri Junta in, in Myanmar, say, you know, we might uh, begin the process of, you know, stripping you off membership because it's an illegal government. Uh, and so that's, I think a lot of people like to see that, uh, that ASEAN do that. So, well, ASEAN can also play another important role and that is the mediation role, right? Uh, so Indonesia uh, can play its traditional role as sort of the major power in the major actors in ASEAN can offer a good office and, you know, begin the process of, uh, 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 mediation, but I think for as a mediation to work, it has to be backed by uh, Western pressure in this case, strong Western pressure against the military hunter um, in Myanmar, so that they have the incentive to come to the negotiation table with the National League for Democracy on San Suu Kyi uh, for a, a compromise, some kinds of a compromise. And so this mediation has to be backed by diplomacy, has to be backed by coercive measures. And, and now, uh, so what does it mean for the for the West? Uh, for uh, for, and I, I think that the UN Security Council seem to be uh, the strong condemnation, strong um, concern expressed by the UN Security Council. But we all know that China is going to veto any uh, 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 interventions, uh, political or military intervention in the domestic affairs of Myanmar, because that also consistent with the. Uh, you know, what, what China, I believe China is a champion of uh, national sovereignty and non-interference in domestic affairs of um, a, nation a nation state. So, uh, and that is hardly surprising. And so here is a question for the West, what do you, what do you have to do about this issue? Because I think the democracy has been, democracy has been under, liberal democracy to be specific, has been under attack for so long, for so long, and the West has been on the retreat. Uh, because of the domestic crises uh, in Europe and the United States. Uh, I don't need to say more about what happened in the United States right now. So the United States has been very, you know, deeply involved in its own domestic crisis and sort of the cultural war and the civil war, uh, uncivil war, if you will, as uh, to use uh, uh, President Biden's term. And, but I think here is a, a reckoning for the West as well. What if the Biden administration, the new administration, has pledged to re-engage um, um, uh, 
the Southeast Asia, ASEAN in particular, and, and, and has talked about, you know, even described what happened in Xinjiang province, what the Chinese Communist Party did or has done uh, to the, the Uyghur in Xinjiang province, even used the term genocide to describe what happened. And so, uh, so there's been interest in, in, uh, in sort of, again, preserving the sort of Western liberalisms and, and, and value and so forth. This is really a test case, a major test case uh, for the Biden administration, not to mention uh, what happened, you know, uh, democracy, uh, an attack on democracy in Russia um, and, and, and Hong Kong. And so, but what I think is that the West has an opportunity as well, uh, especially in the Biden administration, if they want to be serious about, you know, back the rhetoric with action, this is the case because Myanmar has crossed two lines, two red lines. One is the ethnic cleansing and some even called genocide. I'm not an expert on international law, criminal law, but you know, the border of ethnic cleansing and genocide against the Rohingya people. Now you have a political, um, the, uh, the arrest, mass arrest of political dissidents, uh, the, LD, uh, the National League for Democracy. Uh, some even call it politicide, you know, politicide. I mean, it's sort of, uh, a kind of you know, mass persecution against uh, uh, um, a political uh, opponent. And, and so the West has an opportunity, right? Uh, to back diplomacy with coercive action, to incentivize the military of the junta to come to the negotiation table, and ASEAN can offer the mechanism. And I think that ASEAN mediation role uh, alone will not be strong enough because the military junta has, the terminal has survived uh, sanctions and condemnation for so long. I mean, they, they were very well off. Um, they're deep in sort of corporate culture. They're well connected, uh, they're wealthy, and they they are survivors. They've been very resilient against these types of sanctions. So I think if the West is going to do the same thing, uh, such as, uh, you know, targeted sanctions, uh, you know, they can do sanctions uh, all they want, but it's not going to work. I don't think it's going to have a desired effect on the time at all because of the reason I said a while ago. And they, they, they're very well aware of the crisis um, in the West, the crisis in the United States. And of course, uh, China not going to China is the back are not going to be uh, to 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 the demand any change um, and so I, I think that's where we are right now. Well, thank you. That that was that was really uh, interesting and and um, and uh, very concerning as well. Um, I, I guess I, I want to open it up to the audience very soon. So I'm just going to ask one very last question, and that's you know as Cambodia. Uh, as the Cambodian government and as the Cambodian people look at the situation as it's unfolding in uh, Myanmar and as they see both, you know, with this military um, takeover, essentially, and, and now also now they see teachers and nurses and doctors and so forth protesting this. What do you think, what do you think uh, they're thinking? And um particularly within the government and what do they, what do you expect sort of looking forward of, of, of what's going to be the stance going forward and what should it be exactly that will work? Uh, well, you know, um, as I said earlier, so Cambodia has been consistent on um, the principle of national sovereignty. Uh, you know, if you look at the government strategic plans, uh, uh, peace, uh, peace meaning the absence of conflict and war, both internal and external conflict, is essential for economic development, right? Because Cambodia planned to be upper middle class by uh, 2030 and probably delay by at least five years after this, uh, according to the government report, because of the, the, the problems, the socioeconomic problems uh, caused by COVID-19. And, and so um, I think basically people expect to see economic development. So what is troubling about Myanmar is that it is so selfish of the 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 the, the Tanmadar. Um, to because I don't think it's there's an argument uh, to to be made that they really see they're really truly nationalist and cares about national interest because what they're doing is not really for the sake of national interest. It is all about their power to maintain power and to make sure that they will continue to, to stay in power. And that's what it's all about. And I think they kind of acted out because of uh, the fracture of the military power themselves. Because now you have young, I saw a young officer, I, I had, didn't know what young uh, uh, 
a, a, a military officer uh, who travel greatly speak English fluently and travel overseas. So there's a sea change, you know, in terms of the population and demography, uh, in terms of other people of Myanmar. People are better educated. Um, they crave for knowledge. So they are better connected. So, and the internet's really speed has sped up the process. And so I think this is what I think is a different type of society in Myanmar that the terminal is facing now, right? And so, and the same happening in Cambodia. Um, I think that young people want a government that is responsible to make sure that they provide economic development, to make sure that they have a chance to to move up uh, in the sort of social status in terms of getting jobs and uh, and, and 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 you know have a, a better life. I think that's at the basic level. And what's happening right now is this is COVID crisis, and in Myanmar, it's just the government is about to administer vaccination, and this is in the middle of this sort of cri- a global pandemic and the crisis. Of, uh, at home, and the time of what they care, what they do is about their power. It's they care about their power and power only, and so I think it's uh, it is going to be a problem forward. And if a san- economic sanction we, an- we anticipate coming from the West, then it's going to harm uh, the already um, uh, uh, you know uh, problem uh, uh, economic crisis um, uh, in uh, in Myanmar. And so, uh, I mean, the economic data is, it doesn't, doesn't look good. So the economic growth in Myanmar is almost zero. And, and some even predicted it may be in, in the negative. And so this is really a bad time. Uh, of course, for the, the time of never bet is not a bad time. And this is exactly a good time for them. It's an op- they're an opportunist in a sense because everybody will be busy dealing with domestic crisis. So they think this is the time to do it because they see the power uh, kind of, you know, disintegrate disintegrated by uh, the landslide election and it's sort of um, uh, it's, a, it's a major problem and, but at the same time it's an opportunity for them and so I, I, I hope you, I answered your question here sorry yes great uh, helps to not to have the mute on so listen we've got a number of questions coming in and so I would like uh, would you like to uh, let me just read them out to you how about that uh, so the first question comes from TJ. He says, I heard you say that the court is subordinate to the military. Is there a way that the court's power could be elevated to help fight future coup, att- coup attempts or other ways to balance power? Uh, well, uh, thank you for a very good question. You know, the first thing I, when I, when I, when I heard the question, I think about what happened in the United States. But so we all see it, you know, played out. You know, I mean, this is this is really important for uh, uh, for democracy to work. You have to have separate uh, separations of power, right, between the t- three branches of the government. Uh, so, in the United States, you have a luckily, you know, you still have a very strong judicial institution. I mean, the court, all the way from the state, all the way to uh, the Supreme Court. You know, they 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 they're independent. They exercise their independent power and and to say, well, you know. The what happened? You know, the November November third elections uh, uh, was free and fair, and Biden uh, was elected president. And you know, and they litigated many many cases, and they found no uh, systematic uh, uh, of fraud. And, and and so that we see the importance of strong institutions, especially the separations of power. And this in this, but in the United States, you can see that the uh, what really stand between. Um, democracies and authoritarian regime um, is the role of the judiciary, uh, the, the independence of the court. And yes, I think it's very important to have the, uh, you know, a, an independent court. Um, and that's what I see is lacking um, in, in, in many, uh, Saudi, in, in most Southeast Asian countries, um, unfortunately. Um, so the, the, it, it, I mean, in the case of Myanmar, I, I don't think the military uh, ever thought of having an independent court because that's not what because not what they want. Uh, they don't want an independent court. In fact, they're very committed to the separations of power between the three branches: the judiciary, uh, the government, uh, the, the executive branch, uh, and the legislation. But when it comes to that power, the time of power, they are above all the three branches. And so this is the problem, right? So this is the problem. And I think some, some scholar described the system of uh, uh, the military state in Myanmar uh, as uh, sort of you use a concept of central, uh, the, uh, you know, coercive centralism. 
And to me, it's very similar to what I, I've seen during the PRK, the People's Republic of Cambodia. At the time, you know, uh, the, the, the party basically made the, made the decisions and the, you know, and also elected the leader. And similar to what um, uh, happened in Vietnam now, if you look just to the east, right? So recently, uh, during the, thir- the, you know, the 13th Party Congress, uh, the Communist Party elected their own leader. So basically, decision makers also with the Communist Party of Vietnam and the election also the Vietnamese Communist Freedom to the side. And so I think it's quite similar to uh, what you see in Myanmar. The time law is above national politics, above part, uh, sorry, above party politics, right? Uh, they the caretaker, you know, the different term to describe the time of the military, you know, as the guardians of you know the the nation, uh, the caretaker of the government, the vanguard of the national politics, right? And so really, they are above party politics, and that's the problem. And they are above court, and so the Marxist won't work. But when you know. Uh, when when a uh, when a group of leaders claim to be above the law, the rule of law. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is the next question from Vesna. My perspective is, my perspective is that ASEAN will see the coup as a passing event, which does not motivate them to do anything. ASEAN will keep inviting illegal Myanmar governments for meetings. Then the now illegal. Myanmar government, uh, would, would you please give me perspective whether it is still hopeful, whether there is still hope to see positive changes in Myanmar, or is there any hope left? Well, I'm, I, I think you mean when, when you said positive hope, mean positive hope for people who voted for the National League for Democracy, right? Any hope for democracy, right? And so, so, so I, I, I see two potentials. Um, uh, scenarios or likely path forward, right? One is going to be, you know, a uh, going back to 1988, 89, you know, this is a hard coup, right? So basically the military will control every aspect of society. Um, and that's going to be a dark, again, the return to the dark days um, of, of this beautiful country. Um, the second probably a soft coup um, similar to, uh, you know, uh, our Western, you know, Western neighbor, Thailand, you see sort of, uh, you have a military, you know, a military government, uh, but, uh, you know, everything is open, so, you know, still, you know, have sort of engaged in uh, market economies and, you know, doing the people of the business. It seems that nothing um, uh, different, sort of try to give some kind of normalcy to the people, uh, try to build uh, you know, legitimacy to, you know, uh, so that they can continue to rule. Um, so those are the two scenarios uh, that, uh, that that I think are likely to to evolve. But I, I thought also, also is in, if there is any hope, I think that in this case, um, ASEAN, I'm not very optimistic about ASEAN uh, forceful response uh, for the reason that I said a while ago. First, you know, because ASEAN has been... Um, has reaffirmed the principle of non-intervention in domestic affair, internal affair of its fellow member. And clearly we heard ASEAN leaders say loud and clear, right? Some say cons- express concern and some just simply say, well, this is an internal affair of Myanmar and uh, encourage them to come to the negotiation tables and, you know, and, and you know, looking for a way to compromise. And so basically they just want to have, they, they don't want no business dealing with, uh, with Myanmar or antagonize the military. In fact, if you look closely, you know, uh, the military uh, in uh, uh, Southeast Asia in general is not, in, is, is not in the, you know, independent from the executive branch. And we have to be frank about that, you know. Um, and so this is really when one finger pointing at them, another finger uh, at, at Myanmar, another finger pointing at themselves. And so really, I don't think that, that this legal, I, I'm, I'm not optimistic about a very forceful uh, response, although personally I want to see you know, ASEAN uh, taking a more forceful response, you know, at least, as I said, you know, cons- call what happened a, cu- a coup, not not simply, you know, this is a political crisis, you know, the, the terminology that I've heard is not very strong. And so uh, that that's really a reckoning for, for ASEAN. Uh, what else? I'm going to say hopeful. Yeah. So I think um, 
for a change to have take place, meaning for the Tamil Nadu to return to some form of democratic governance or a compromise with the National League for the Democracy. I think personally it has to be a forceful response, uh, for, you know, from from the West, uh, because as I said, you know, the West have been on the retreat when it come to democratic backsliding around the world for the past two decades or so, since 2009-11, right? So the last time the United States uh, took an off- offensive promotion of democracy, at least what they said, claimed to be, is in, you know, 2003 when the United States invaded Iraq, right, to for regime change. Uh, so I don't, I'm not talking, I'm not talking about regime change uh, through military, direct military intervention here, but that's sort of the, sort of the last resort uh, from the West. But I think that there's different venues that the West can encourage or create incentive for the military junta to change their behavior. And I think that the only language that the military junta understand uh, is force or coercion, right? It's coercive measure. I'm not, again, I'm not talking about direct military intervention, uh, but, but that should not be ruled out. Um, but through the United Nations, right, through the UN Security Council, uh, so the a diplomacy, multilateralism, back multilateral diplomacy, backed by threat of sanctions, and and nothing's uh, uh, left out on the table. You know, it's that everything's on the table, and so to send a clear message to the Tamil Nadu that uh, their interests, economics interests, will be at stake. That you know, uh, that the, the people they have to come back to back to doing the people business. Right, because the majority of uh, Myanmar's people already answered. They want the National League for Democracy uh, to lead the government, and so, uh, so really, this is really uh, a positive change has to come from both inside Myanmar. Because as I said about ago, people in Myanmar, are very young people, are very brave, and they demand they are better educated and they are more sophisticated, and and they well aware of what's going on outside, even. As I said, the military officer, young military officer in the Taliban or in the military regimes, and so we cannot assume that everyone in the military want the same thing, uh, a, a coup, which be really you know goes against their uh, broader national interest. And so that I think that, that it takes uh, both the internal resistance and also the external pressure. And ASEAN can play an important role, as I said before. In my view, ASEAN uh, diplomacy can only work if there's a strong external pressure from the West, right? From the West and with perhaps uh, with, with, with China, because, uh, you know, China is another, you know, another important card, another important player um, in this uh, in this sort of complex uh, 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 diplomacy or sanctions against Vietnam, because, you know, any sanctions against the military would not work if without, you know, without China support, or at least, you know, refrain from, backing the military and so but that's as the whole other issue that we we, we 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 need some more time to talk about when it comes to geopolitical struggle because myanmar uh, prefer to take a neutral foreign policy because being sandwiched by two most populous uh uh uh, uh nations uh, in asia india and 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 and, and china so in fact even Aung San Suu Kyi's foreign policy is more neutral right take a neutralist uh uh, a policy try to balance one power off another, and so really, um, so 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 that's a very complex issue. But now I'm going to say this. So the point I want to make is that ASEAN diplomacy can only be effective uh, uh, against the military junta uh, if they want to do so, and it has to be backed by coercive measures by the West. Yes, that follows perfectly into the next question, which you spoke about some. But I, but if you have something more you want to add on it, which comes from Lois, which is other than condemning the coup verbally, what role can the U.S., what role can U.S. foreign policy play and will it have any effect? Um, from from who exactly? Lois. Oh, okay, from, from the boss. <laughs> um, so I, I sort of answered that question. Um, uh, so th- there's an argument uh, I've heard from the pundits say, you know, because China is another, f- because the uh, United States view uh, Myanmar from the prism of sort of a global competition between China and United States, right? That's what Washington is seeing this view, I think. And so um, one of the concerns is that if they push uh, too hard, you know, push the military to the to a corner, they're going to uh, 
uh, become more dependent on the on, on China because right now even the military had a history of of uh, problems with the uh, you know with the with China because the Chinese supported the communists. So again, there's a long history. There's a very you know a uh, fractured relation between uh, the the Tatmadaw and the Chinese Communist Party. So they're not always you know have smooth relations with one another. So the concern is that if the West pushing too hard against the Tatmadaw, they will move closer to China, and that's in terms of geopolitical struggle, China, United States would lose. And in my view, I think uh, the military already know, I think they, they know, they know that they, the West not going to stand idle by and, you know, watch they take over uh, through a coup like this. They, they expect some kind of strong response from the West, and they probably have, I mean, I don't know, probably have uh, the negotiation you know, from some kind of talk with China. What If this that happened, uh, then they would need the Chinese support to look at offset any economic sanctions against the, uh, the, the, the military state run by the Tatmadaw. I do not know whether that arrangement exists because there must be some secret talk between the two, you know, to two sides. And so that's, I think, a part of the calculation from the United States. And so, but my argument is that the United States has to be, I mean, they're going to move closer, the Tatmadaw are going to move closer to China anyway. Uh, if you impose simply targeted sanctions against the military elites and the families, you know, try to restrict the visas and so forth. And I just don't think that's going to be effective. I don't think that's going to have a different result or the change that one of the the, the, the question I got a while ago. And I think that that's not going to have any meaningful change on the ground because the, the terminal has survived. As I said earlier, they, has, they, they, is, they are the survivor of, of Western sector prolonged and, and massive sanction by the West. And I think they're going to survive again if the, the West is going to do the same thing, as simply impose economic sanction, not backed by some kind of, you know, uh, um, a military threat, um, threats of direct intervention um, um, against the Tatmadaw. And so now when it comes to the Biden administration, and I'm very concerned in that, uh, that the rhetoric, or so at least the desired policy, foreign policy, you know, to re uh, reestablish, restore American uh, um, uh, leadership in the world, meaning to promote democracies and human, uh, defend and protect human rights abroad. And I'm very concerned that because of the domestic crisis in the United States, we've seen a mess in, in this country, right? Uh, look at the, you know, uh, and compared to other Asian countries, the United States failed uh, uh, in terms of dealing, managing the COVID crisis. And so I don't need to talk more because we all know that because we, because we live in this crisis. And so because of domestic divisions and, and, and economic crisis, multiple crises in the United States, I suspect that you know, that that the simply just talk, uh, and the benefits are not going to be able to take any con I mean, I mean, coercive sanctions against the military. And that's my concern. But that said, I would say that if uh, the Biden administration uh, is able to control uh, COVID nineteen, uh, COVID nineteen, and emerge economic, restore economic uh, a situation in the United States. Uh, you know, um, by the end of um, uh, this, uh, by the end of the first uh, Biden administration, and assuming that and there's a second uh, Biden administration, I would expect that the Biden administration would be free from domestic crisis at home and to be able to to deal forcefully with the military hunter. Because I think it's, it's this, this is a reckoning for the West as well. They, the West have to respond in some way because if they just say that they, that they want to promote democracies and, and, and human rights, I would say that Myanmar is a case. It's a, it's a strong case uh, for that to happen. Uh, because as I said earlier, they cross two red lines. Uh, you know, the ethnic cleansings against the minorities and uh, the Muslim minorities in, uh, in the, the Rakhine states. And now they launch, successfully launched a hostile coup against um, the, 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 the winner of the uh, free and fair election on November 8th. So we have a few more questions. And so I'm going to sort of combine two. Um, it's a question from Rota and a question from Leighton. Um, I'm going to read Leighton's question because I think it encapsulates the, the other question, Irita. Um, so it says, while the optics of a military coup in Burma are making worldwide headlines, the dissolution of the opposition, uh, of the opposition and of the independent media in Cambodia in the early 2010s didn't make nearly the same headlines. How do the actions of the Cambodian People's Party in stifling democracy compare to those of the Burmese military 
And is there a way forward for both of these countries in the broader Southeast Asian region? Uh, well, the 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 the, the, the West respond as again, you know, the lack of uh, political will from 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 the West is, is very clear uh, in, in the case of Cambodia. Um, but there, there's there's marked the, the fundamental differences between what happened in Cambodia in 2017 um, and uh, February first. Uh, so, the, in the case of Cambodia, is a uh, again the Cambodian claim that the you know the treasons uh, committed by the um, the the CNRP um, and, and and then claim to you know and then just dissolve the election uh, of the of the opposition party. Uh, so basically, uh, you and then ho- and held the election, right? So there was election, and they claimed to have won the, uh, the 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 general election, massive winning. So in in this case in Myanmar, you have a situation where the military wrote the constitution in two thousand eighteen and claimed to abide by this constitution. And they held the elections with the participation of the National League for Democracy. Uh, but they don't like the outcome. I think probably they, they're quite unexpected. The, the outcome is quite ex- unexpected. They probably they, they, they thought that they could have, you know, the, the proxy party, uh, USDP, could have won more uh, so that they can actually claim more power uh, in, the, uh, in the legislature. So the, that's one fundamental difference. Um, the opposition party were completely barred from uh, um, participating in the election. So we didn't know the, the election, the outcome of the election. And so it's debatable. The election took place in Cambodia and the Cambodian people won. At least they claim they won uh, fair and square. And uh, because we, we have, the people have disagreements about, about the, the process, right? About the process that is free and fair. And so that I think the difference between the two cases. Uh, but I, I should note that another difference is that the economic development. So Cambodia has, uh, under the, uh, the ruling party, has been able to uh, to uh, to achieve economic development, uh, quite impressive economic development in a sense, uh, to take care of the people living standard, uh, and, and and much better than the military in, in, in Myanmar. Because I mean, you think about right now in the middle of the crisis, right? The military junta are taking this action, drastic action. And it would it would invite sanctions against the country, and it would destroy Myanmar my economy. And and again, you know, it's in the middle of, of a pandemic, is a crisis uh, during the period of vaccination and so forth. And yet, of a political crisis like this, right? And so that's a fundamental difference. Uh, the second uh, 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 difference between the two cases, uh, the Cambodian People Party has been able to. I think that's one of the highlight of, of the achievement is the economic development. Um, we can we can make an argument about the legitimacy of of, of the election, and that is um, a, a question to be to, to, to for 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 the discussion. Um, but the Tatmadaw, uh, the, the the military in Myanmar, has been very unpopular among the people. I mean, the majority of the super majority of the Myanmar people voted for the National League for Democracy. Their proxy party won a very small, minor, uh, a small uh, uh, part of the uh, of, of the vote in the, in the November eight election, and so that I think we need to consider the performance base of the uh, 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 Cambodian People Party is something that we have to c- c- consider. Um, that I think is the uh, main differences uh, between the two cases. Okay, great. We're we're getting close to uh, the ten o'clock hour, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a couple. I, I think that there is a couple more questions that that deal with pretty much that same issue of this comparison between um, the CPP government and uh, the situation in Miramar. Um, but I want to move first to a couple. If we have time, we can loop back there um, since you just spoke about that. So I just want to read off a couple more questions. I'm going to read them both to you so you can answer them mm-hmm. then consecutively to save some time. So one is from Laura. Hi, Kosala. You said you talked to young military personnel. Are there any divisions within the military at all? And the second question is from Rata. Is China behind the coup in Myanmar? Um, I don't know the. I don't have a you know clear answer to both questions. To be honest with you, um, but uh, 
in terms of the sort of the the military, uh, Yang, you know, there's a lot of studies on on on, on the Birri Hunter, the the Tamilar. Um, but from what from my conversation, I can you know, is talking to a few um, a yeah, small group of uh, military officer that really disqualify me from saying you know the majority. But I you know my sense is that from you know in combination with other discussion that I had uh, with, with 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 other young people, it's. It seems that there's a, some kind of fracture. Of course, the military try to hide, uh, you know, with, uh, try to hide uh, uh, the, the fracture within the military, uh, the, the file and ranks, uh, the ranks and file of the military. But uh, there's, there's, there's been some evidence that the, the younger military officers are better educated and well aware of, of what happened in the past. And, and they were well aware that this sort of situation, this sort of military coup was bad for the country. Um, and so they looking at this, with a mirror view, you know, of what happened in 1988-89 and sort of the consequence, economic consequences um, of the country being isolated from the international community. And, and, and Myanmar has just, uh, you know, resurfaced and, and again joined the international community and become part of the world economy. And, and the country has a lot of potential in terms of uh, geopolitical potential. I mean, close border with India and China. So, uh, it, it, so really, um, my sense is that, uh, you know, young military officers have a quite a different view from the senior military leadership. And I think that's my suspicion is that the military acted out now because they understand that the power is uh, slipping away and, and, and there's a serious fracture within the society and, and the proxy party is deeply unpopular. And that I think you want to compare with, uh, with, with Cambodia. And I think that's uh, it's, it's a different it, it's in the case of Cambodia because uh, the Cambodian government has, to some extent, has been able to, uh, you know, show up economic development, you know, massive infrastructure with the help of, of China to be able to use that sort of economic development and to be the vanguard of peace after sort of the win-win uh, policy in 1998. So basically, the ruling party in Cambodia claimed to be the vanguard of peace and economic development. That's sort of the two uh, major uh, achievements that... Uh, that the, the uh, Cambodian People Party has achieved since 1998, and then sort of provide a vision for the country, you know, to be a develop, uh, to be you know high income, upper middle income, upper uh, middle income by, you know, 20, 30, or 35. And so that's that. Uh, that I think really has some positive effects in terms of showing up legitimacy. Uh, of the ruling party after the dissolution of the CNRP in 2017. Now, in coming to the question of China again, you know, uh, you know, this uh, uh, this uh, so, so they got a secret, right? And so I don't I I, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I but we can speculate that if the West uh, decided to impose heavy economic sanctions against uh, or targeted sanctions against the Billy Hunter, the Tatmadaw in Myanmar. It is likely that uh, China would would gain tremendously because you know is Myanmar is part of the buffer zone uh, in China strategic thinking you know just like North Korea, uh, Mongolia, um, uh, Vietnam, and Myanmar. So here you have a case uh, where you know Myanmar is a pivotal state in this sort of uh, geopolitical chess game. Uh, competition between the United States and, and 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 China. So China view Myanmar in the context of rivalry with India, um, democratic India's and aligned with the United States. And so, uh, to be honest, I do not know. I suspect that uh, that uh, yeah, it's, you know that China would uh, would want to defend uh, the military junta because they because you know there's no love lost between uh, the LDP National League for Democracy and the Communist Party of China, you know, a democratic voice uh, uh, party uh, is, is also not a fan of the Communist Party of China either. So I think there seems clearly in terms of ide political ideology, in terms of the geopolitical interests uh, that it seemed the, the nationalists, uh, Tatmadaw, uh, the military in Myanmar, uh, and their interests, economic interests are aligned uh, with China. You know, let me tell you a personal story. When I was uh, I stay at a hotel. I don't remember the exact name of the hotel in Naypyidaw, the capital city of, of, of Myanmar. So in the morning, I woke up. You know, went to the uh, 
you know, to get a breakfast. And then this sort of massive numbers of Chinese uh, investor. And then I found out that they actually came to buy Jade, which is, you know, the military in Myanmar control uh, mining um, businesses, uh, you know, so they, 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 they have the economic powers, right? Uh, they have hands on pretty much um, many, many uh, resource rich area. They control different pockets of uh, you know, the, I, what I saw, the jade trade really strongly, closely, I think, uh, with, uh, 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 with China. So there's an economic alignment and strategic alignment between the Tamadars and the and Beijing. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised that uh, China would come out and defend uh, the, the, the Tamadar. Um, especially against the Western interventions, trying to have a, you know, a pro-West regimes in, in uh, Naipaul. Okay, so we are at the 10 o'clock hour. There are several more questions um, that have just been coming in and some that were there before, some of which you've touched on, especially between, uh, as I said, you know, comparing uh, the, Cam the Cambodian government with uh, the military government in, in, um, in Myanmar. Uh, so what I suggest is that um, we wrap it up here. However, uh, if any of you would like to contact Dr. Kosal to, and send your questions to him, we can do it. If you just, we have your questions in the chat. And we have the questions um, also in the Q&A and on the Facebook Live. Um, but what you can do is you can uh, send it to um, send somebody at, at CKS and either she or Tree Sungi can, um, can take your email address if you don't just message them. Um, let's see, are they in the chat yet? Uh, maybe... Uh, Sunday, would you like to put a, an email down and then we can forward them to uh, Dr. Pat and he could respond. So thank you very much all for coming on such short notice. It's been a very interesting evening with Dr. Pat. Thank you very much, uh, Kosal. Um, and thank you, everyone else. Have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful day. And uh, we'll see you uh, next time. Please remember to check the CKS social media and the websites for upcoming events. Thank you very much. Sam Akun. Thank you. Akun Chan. Akun Chan. <laughs>